Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of The Crowded Booth. I'm your host, Bryce Kuhn, and I'm joined along today with esteemed guest, uh, Coach Vince Dooley, and he was kind enough to let us into his home uh, this afternoon and be able just to get a little bit more, to know more about him and uh, some of the things that he's passionate about, not only coaching and what everyone knows about with his history with Georgia football. So thank you for letting us come in today, Coach. Well, I'm glad that you're here, and uh, if it shows up in the background, you can see that uh, you're surrounded by bulldogs. There's a lot of bulldogs here uh, in uh, in my home. Yeah, definitely. He has a just a plethora of options here. Uh, if you're a Georgia fan, it's it's a really cool experience. And if he ever lets anyone else in his home, uh, I'm sure that they get to experience this as well. Uh, if you want to watch this, you make sure to check us out on YouTube and Facebook. And if you want to listen to the audio only, then go ahead and, and check us out on iTunes and make sure to like and subscribe all those as well. Uh, so the first thing we're talking about with Coach Dooley is uh, he has a passion for gardening and. Some people close, closer to him and um, have paid attention a little more to his life know that, but the younger generation my age might not be aware of that. And so, Coach, you've written a book on gardening, and so where did that passion from gardening come from? Well, it, actually, I always say that one of the great things about living around a university, if you've got it, and I've been around a university probably 60-plus years of my life, uh, that if you've got a curiosity about anything, you can satisfy it because there's an expert on everything at a university. So I have always enjoyed uh, auditing courses uh, in history, uh, the Civil War, and other disciplines. And I was always curious about trees and plants. Um, and I thought I would take one course on tree and plant identification that would take care of it. But as it turned out, one course led to another and led to another and it aroused my curiosity and uh, so out of that, uh, I became a, a gardener. So I tell people I'm an inspiration for anybody that wants to be a gardener late in life because I could not have told you uh, what a grapefruit was from a gladiola 20 years ago. Uh, and I'm also an inspiration for anybody that wants to write a book about gardening uh, because I have written one. This is called Vince Dooley's Garden, The Horticultural Journey of a football coach, and it's illustrated by a fellow named Steve Penley. That's a very talented uh, artist. Um, so anyway, that's my, my passion. It's my golf. Uh, when people uh, get a tea time and go out, all I got to do is go out the door <laughs> and start working, and that's where uh, I get away from it all. So uh, that's, uh, that sums up my uh, gardening experience, but I'm still learning. That's the great thing about it because I've always found that it's uh, good for the body if you're out there working. Uh, it's good for the mind because you're constantly learning, and it's certainly good for the soul just mm -hmm. to get out. You talk about, you know, you've written some books and written that and also talk about your love for history and be able to experience that here at this university. Um, you've written some books, the, the Legions of Fighting Bulldog. What, what is your passion and why the Civil War? What, is, what stands out to you about the Civil War from all the other events in history? Well, I think that uh, history, first of all, I, I have a, a real interest uh, in history. Uh, it's like someone said uh, that uh, if you don't know where you've been, how are you going to know where you're going? So we all draw from history, our own personal history, uh, as well as the history particularly of this country that I'm mm -hmm. uh, uh, very interested in. And, uh, and the greatest crisis this country ever faced was the Civil War. It really defined uh, what we are, what country we, we became. Um, and, uh, and then there's a lot of just uh, special interest because there's so many uh, fascinating individuals uh, that were involved in the Civil War. A great debate, a debate that took, uh, uh, went from uh, uh, political d debates to act outright war. Uh, and, uh, and it's interesting because uh, I guess there's over 90,000 books that have been written on the Civil War. There's been 20,000 books written uh, on Abraham Lincoln as an example. So there's a tremendous interest uh, in the war, and I'm also on the Civil War Trust, which is a, an organization that preserves Civil War battlefields. Mm -hmm. In fact, they have done such a great job in doing that that the federal government, the Department of the Interior, 
asked the trust to take on the Revolutionary War in the War of 1812. So we are also doing that as well. So we may end up probably being called uh, the, uh, uh, the, the American Battlefield Trust, uh, which includes all battlefields. So I just primarily from uh, my interest in history. And would you like to tell us a little bit about your book, uh, the, oh. the Legion's Fighting Bulldog as well? Um, I know I have personally have not read it, but I've read some reviews on it, and, and people seem to love it. Well, it's, uh, it, it's something that I had, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in the back of my mind uh, because I read a book uh, by a historian on the retreat from Gettysburg. Uh, the Confederates, when they retreated, uh, the ambulance train was 17 miles long. There were 7,000 casualties that were going away from Gettysburg to cross the Potomac. And uh, among those that were in there were this, was this fellow from Athens, Georgia. Uh, he was living in Athens. He became a colonel in uh, Cobb's Legion. Uh, he was a first honor graduate at the university. And uh, also, uh, he was so good, they brought him back as an instructor in foreign language. So there's a natural local tie that interested me. So he had uh, led a charge on the second day of, uh, of Gettysburg and was barely sabered badly in his uh, head. So he was in this ambulance train, uh, all bandaged up. And when they got to the Potomac, because of the fact that it had rained so hard, and because of the fact that the uh, Union Cavalry Division was about to annihilate them, uh, they couldn't cross because the river was swollen, mm -hmm. so they had to form a perimeter. Well, this fella gets out of his wagon and w rounds up about 200 others that are injured like him but are still capable of firing a rifle. So he, uh, he was the one that helped to set up that defense uh, to try to hold off the Union Cavalry, which they did. And anyway, I was impressed with this guy. I said, this guy's a real hero. I, and he's from Athens. And I found out that he's got, uh, uh, there's about 200 letters in the library between he and his wife. And uh, so I mentioned that, uh, that this is one project, if I ever got the time that I wanted to work on, finally did. And uh, I teamed up with a fellow named Sam Thomas who had just found the papers and he was just beginning to transcribe them. So it took us five years to do this book. Uh, and uh, the, the, the people asked, well, why is it called a, a fighting bulldog? Which uh, certainly has a, uh, a familiarity with, mm -hmm. with me and the university. But he was such a leader and so well respected by his men that one person described him because of that, of having three admirable attributes, commanding presence, superb generalship, and the courage of a bulldog. So when I saw that, I said, that's going to be the name of the book. You talk about you know all, all the stuff you've written from uh, history of Athens, like you have this book right here, the Civil War with its ties to Athens. Where does your passion for writing come from, and when did you discover that? Well, <clears throat> it, again, there's nothing natural about it. Uh, some people, and I certainly uh, envy those uh, that have uh, uh, been journalism majors that early on wrote, uh, which I didn't do. Uh, but what I did do, I, was, uh, I took history uh, and uh, then got a master's in history. I actually finished in business. And then when I went in the Marine Corps and came back out, I started taking history courses because I enjoyed it so much. So I got another degree and then basically got a master's degree in history. But with every course, there's a paper required. And every paper, you had to do research and you had to write. So my passion came from that. I really enjoyed particularly the research. Some people, particularly those of journalism majors, are more natural at writing. Uh, but uh, I loved the research and had to discipline myself to do the writing. So that, more than anything else, is how I got into it. 
I've read some of your your books and they're very well written and phenomenal. And I look forward to being able to read that book as well. Um, so we've talked about you know the gardening aspect. Is there anything that you're planning on growing this spring that I, that you, you, you no, haven't told anybody yet? Uh, most of my plants and trees are ornamental. Uh, though Barbara, my wife, asked me, why don't you grow something we can eat? <laughs> well, I've got a place out there that I've kind of set aside for her mm. uh, because she loves to cook, and there would be fresh vegetables. So uh, there's, a, there's a place for her to do that. Uh, mine is mostly ornamentals, and uh, I'm very much into a variety of trees and plants. For instance, I love Japanese maples, uh, camellias, in fact, I love anything that's doing its thing. And right at this moment, we have camellias that are doing its thing. And uh, also uh, what we call Asian magnolias. Some people call them Japanese magnolias. They're not the magnolias that we call the southern magnolias that we know. Mm -hmm. But these are ones that came from the Far East. And they have, a be have beautiful flowers. And they are deciduous. And that is that the leaves fall off in the wintertime. And the flower comes on before the leaves come out. Uh, so they're doing their thing right now. Uh, so it uh, it just depends. And I'm always looking for some plan I don't have. So uh, after quite a while and a lot of study and a lot of interest, uh, I've got, you might call it a mini botanical garden here. I know that Miss Barbara is going to be definitely happy that you provided a place for her that she can grow some something to eat and, and not only just the plants that are beautiful. That's right. That way. She, uh, I hadn't quite gotten her into that yet, but I'm working on it. You're working on it. So as we transition into more of the story that people mostly know about you, and obviously your time at Georgia and the accolades that you accumulated there, and your time as the head coach and athletic director, um, one of the questions I have, I mean, why did you decide to become a coach, and when was it when you were, you made that decision, I want to get into coaching? Well, I never was quite sure uh, that my life was kind of planned out. Uh, I really started out uh, with the idea of not going into coaching because there was no security, and they didn't pay very well in those <laughs> days. Uh, so I took business. I mean, I said, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to be – trapped into a profession that doesn't pay very well and uh, and there's no security in it. But yet, uh, I played football. Uh, I coached uh, football and played in the Marine Corps. And then when the time for me to come out, uh, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. Uh, and I had some options. I had a chance to go in the banking business, really, a chance to a coach at one or two places, but I had an opportunity to go back to school where I went to, and that's Auburn. Mm -hmm. uh, and I said, well, I'm going to give it a try and see. Uh, and it, it was just a, a natural thing. From that moment that I started uh, coaching, I never felt like that I ever went to work a day in my life. In fact, I've never felt that way. Uh, and so it became a passion early on, and uh, once I, I got into coaching, then I wanted to do well in it, so I committed myself to it. Uh, there's a drive to compete, but as you go along, uh, that drive never lessens, but you also see the, the influence that you could have in a positive way, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a self-satisfaction uh, of coaching as well. So... Uh, it just evolved, uh, and uh, and I, I'm still uh, reaping those rewards uh, because uh, so many players that I, I had the privilege of coaching in so many different fields. Uh, it's just great to see them uh, again, not as a uh, as a coach, uh, a student, or pupil, but someone that we've grown closer to. Uh, over the years, uh, and that's very rewarding. It's it's like teachers. Uh, uh, one of the great, um, I think, uh, uh, feelings or rewards that a coach could have or a teacher could have is at some point in time, one of your students will come back and say two simple words, uh, thanks, coach, or thanks, teacher, uh, for uh, for helping me to, uh, to be better disciplined, uh, to... Uh, 
helped me to learn how to win and how to lose in a, in a proper attitude. Uh, and that's the rewarding part of it as it is with teachers. You talk a lot about – we talked la- a couple weeks ago with a, a former Auburn player that's just beginning his coaching career, and he was talking about why it's really important for when the Auburn coaching staff came to him to – he wanted to grow as a man, not only as a football player, while he was at his time there, and, and he was able to get that. And, you know, you're talking a little bit about how – some of your players come back and talk about, you know, whether it's you were able to help build character with them. What were some things that you tried to implement in your coaching style that made sure not only are these guys going to grow as football players, but as men throughout their time at Georgia? Well, I think that so much of it is is just uh, being raised. Uh, you go back to your parents and uh, you learn uh, just basic values uh, to start with. I mean, I'm sure that you've uh, heard the same thing that I heard from parents. And I was fortunate to have uh, parents that had uh, good high moral standards, uh, spiritual. They, they didn't have the formal education uh, that uh, maybe some other parents had. I mean, neither one of them finished grammar school. But at the same time, they gave me some values that probably was far more important than a formal education. I got that myself. Uh, my daddy saying, if you say you're going to do something, do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything that's worth doing is worth doing well. And I can still hear my mama saying, uh, uh, manners will take you where money won't. I never understood that quite, but yet there's a great lesson there. And then to have the influence of your coach. My high school coach was very important to me. Uh, and uh, then to the people that are around me, I... I think I had a good ability to pick out good heroes and to emulate them growing up. Heroes that uh, that I love as sports heroes, but other heroes uh, like Nelson Mandela, for instance. Uh, where I spent a lot of time in South Africa, a lot of time, two or three different times, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed studying him. Here's a guy that was in prison for 25 years and came out and preached forgiveness. So those kinds of heroes uh, have all influenced me. And uh, so I tried to set my standard that's that high and to be a positive example for people that I was associated with. You talk about coaches that are having a big impact, and we have one here now, the current head coach at University of Georgia, Kirby Smart, who's there's been a buzz around Athens that hasn't been here in a while, and obviously with this past year, although it didn't end up the way um, most most people wanted it to. Um, what can you say about his impact that he's had now, and what from stepping back now is you're no longer a coach, but still having that coach mindset. What is he doing well that um, maybe people don't see behind the scenes that he was able to take these guys in a year that probably most projected didn't wasn't going to make the national championship game and was able mm-hmm. to bring them together and uh, make that really awesome run. Well, first of all, he um, I made the statement that I didn't hire him. Uh, the current athletic director, Greg McGarrity, did. But after he hired him, I did make the statement publicly uh, because I believed it, and it, I think it was a positive re- reaction, that if I had been in the same situation, which I had been on some other occasions, that's who I would have gone after. Mm-hmm. Because here's a guy that, uh, in Kirby Smart, uh, great upbringing. His daddy was a football coach, so that's a terrific start. Um uh, and uh, also, he uh, had, uh, he's a Georgia graduate. Mm-hmm. He played here. Uh, he knows the state. Uh, he's been uh, an assistant, uh, without a doubt, uh, under the best program uh, in college football in the decade of the, of the 20th, uh, 2000, 2010. Uh, somewhat like when I hired Mark Rick. Mm -hmm. Uh, who during the decade of the 90s, Florida State arguably might have been the the greatest program, and he was a vital part of that. And Kirby Smart was a vital part, has been a vital part of Alabama. Uh, So that's a tremendous background, and uh, and that's why I would have uh, have hired him. And he's put together a good staff. He's come to Georgia at a terrific time. Uh, there's, There's great resources in this state. Uh, and it's even better now than ever before. And uh, so he knows how to coach. Uh, and uh, he's well-organized, uh, great enthusiasm. 
uh, and uh, uh, what is even more impressive it, from a, a continuous standpoint, this particular year was special, and sometimes you can have those years. Uh, uh, everything fell into place, and they've got to fall in place in order to have that kind of year. By that, I mean, uh, number one, you had four of the top players that normally would have gone pro decided not to go pro mm -hmm. and to come back. Uh, and uh, two running backs, as an example, the two defensive ends. Uh, then uh, you have a, a freshman quarterback that uh, has to step in because the normal starting quarterback hurts his uh, knee and is out. And then this young freshman has to go to South Bend and, and play Notre Dame on his first start as a freshman. And that worked out. Then you had a linebacker from... Montezuma, Georgia, that was supposed to go to UCLA but decided to stay home. And he leads a defense, maybe the best uh, speed defense I've seen. And then you got a kicker. We didn't have a great punting uh, situation, but we got a punter that uh, is from Columbia. Mm -hmm. So he decides to come to Georgia. He seeks out Georgia. We don't seek him out. And that falls into place. And then you've got a kicker non, non Rodrigo, who uh, is a walk-on, and uh, and has ended up being one of the greatest kickers <laughs> we ever had. So a lot of things have fallen into place, <clears throat> and you'll have those years. But in order to have the consistency of winning every year, you got to recruit good every year, and Alabama has done that. And uh, this is a great indication that this could happen. Because now for the second year in a row, we're up there in the top two or three of the recruiting, recruiting classes in the country. So there's great uh, uh, optimism about the future, and that's my observation as, as to why there is and with good reason. I think when watching that game back in January, it definitely that was one of the hardest ways to lose a game. But you have to be excited about the future, talking about building that depth that Alabama seems to have every single year. They can have a five-star guy come in if another five-star goes out. And it's just a, a crazy thing to watch. And Kirby's definitely built that with the addition of just recruiting classes. Last year obviously had a top five, and this year the number one. Um, the last question I have for you is what do you feel about the quarterback situation uh, here at Georgia with a guy coming in who is a very highly touted prospect in Justin Fields from Harrison High School? He's going to try to battle the – starter last year who was a freshman who had to battle the start of the previous year. Now, obviously, Easton has decided to transfer, but um, both guys have a mentality of they're going to compete. Both of them played multi, uh, both sports in high school. I was fortunate to be able to watch um, the kid from Harrison be able to play baseball and football this past year and uh, just a, a really good athlete. Uh, what, do you, what do you say as a coach when you have two guys that are just – amazing talents, but different players. How do you make that decision and, and what, what goes into that? Well, uh, you could see it as a problem, but it's one of the greatest problems I've ever known to have. You'd like to have that problem. Uh, you do, you do have a quarterback that has proven a winner, uh, has uh, a great uh, leadership qualities and uh, is mentally tough. Uh, and then you got the other quarterback that's a, obviously a very gifted athlete, a good student. Both of them are good students. Uh, and there'll be intense competition. Uh, I really believe that. But I believe that that competition will help both of them. Mm -hmm. It'll make them better. Uh, and uh, we'll just have to see what will happen. You just you don't know, as we saw going into this year. I mean, injuries could come in and affect it. So you've got to have depth. And it's great to have that kind of depth to start with at that position. Uh, there'll be a lot of speculation. Everybody will have an opinion. Um, and uh, I think it's one of the greatest problems I could ever imagine having. I'd love to have that kind of a problem. Uh, but I think it also bodes well for, uh, for the, uh, the two quarterbacks. that they, uh, They're both very mature. Uh, they'll compete, compete hard, uh, and they'll improve uh, because of that competition, uh, and it gives us tremendous depth. Uh, and to have it all uh, right here in, in one position at, at the most critical position of the football team. So uh, it just adds to uh, the brightness of the future. Well, it's definitely exciting to be a Georgia fan. We were able to highlight 
things throughout the season in previous shows that were just you talking about those four guys that came back, that really meant a lot to the program and to Kirby Smart and probably set a standard that might not have been here in recent years. So we just want to thank you for letting us uh, come in today and interview you. So thank you very much for being on the show with us today. Well, good luck to you. You've uh, got a great start. You seem like you know you know what you want to do, and you're certainly often doing it very, very well. So I wish you a lot of luck. It's been a pleasure working with you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for tuning in. And if you want to get updates on our next show, uh, make sure to like us on YouTube, Facebook, and all social media platforms. And um, we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you for tuning in.